and welcome to Fueling Around with me, Jason Plato, and the jam in my roly-poly. Of course, it's Dave Vitti. Hello. So, Fueling Around is powered by Adrian Flux. As the UK's largest specialist insurance broker, Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help you save money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. So, our guest today... Well, he's a pretty special dude. He's a gentleman that knows his way around the kitchen. And I'm not just talking about spag ball or, um, or that Geordie dish, chicken fat. He does. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, talking, I'm talking proper cooking. Posh nosh, as you might say. And if there's one person that in my lockdown bubble I would want to be with me cooking up a storm, it would be our guest today. It's the one and only Mr. Tom Kerridge. Hey! <laughs> hey, gentlemen, how are we? We're good. We're really good. good. Welcome, mate. and thank you for joining our little uh, Petrolhead Forum. Thanks very much, mate. Thanks for the invite. Thanks it's for the a, invite. It's a pleasure. How's, how's life treating you? How are you coping with... Uh, I mean, it must be tough, isn't it? In your situation, lockdown, you must be itching to get those doors open again yeah it's been quite a bumpy year i think for everybody i mean i know the guys in sport and motorsport in particular you know people some people have been able to get on and do some stuff but in general you know it's very difficult um any industry that is involving people being together <laughs> has been pretty much <laughs> shut down and it's been a nightmare so yeah hospitality has been very bumpy this year but you know things like live music events they've been you know travel tourism airlines there's so many industries that have been hit really hard so yeah it's been it's been a bumpy old year um but you know the idea that there's light at the end of the tunnel that people are coming out the other side that you know there's m- millions and millions of people being vaccinated the fact that there is a bit of a vibe and a feeling that we can kind of half get back together uh, to some form of normality is something mm. that we're and then we're all looking forward to aren't we yes certainly am i mean last week we were having a chat with dave and he's got it tattooed on his arm when beer garden day is it if you <laughs> oh, by, the, by the way 24 days today 24 days is? yeah 24 days today at the time of recording i'm not sure when you'll hear this but at the time of recording it's 24 days until beer gardening season starts <laughs> and i do you know what april will never will never be the same again like everybody yeah <laughs> april is still raining it's a bit cold it can be a bit miserable and horrible this year april is going to be everyone's august isn't it it's going to be people <laughs> stood in beer gardens huddled around patio heaters with umbrellas just going no no this is great this is what we all wanted it's amazing yeah so i think a- april is going to be the new august i've got a selection of jumpers just ready <laughs> <laughs> i saw a great video actually on facebook this morning tom and it was it was with everybody looking forward to exactly this sort of getting back to the pubs and sitting outside or doing whatever you could in the hospitality world and there was this couple there sort of sat outside eating soup in what must have been like a force 10 gale or something <laughs> just thinking yeah. we yeah. can be outside we're gonna do it we'll brace the british weather well do you know what if there's if there's any country in the world that is more ready to be outside in the rain just getting on with life it's us <laughs> isn't it? i mean we kind of are aren't we aren't we the highest um buyers of convertible cars in europe you know, we buy more convertible cars than anybody else. <laughs> However, we only have three days in the in the, of summer. I mean, it's ridiculous. So I think we we embrace any chance of being outside in, if possible. So you know, there's nothing wrong with being in a convertible car and a very thick coat. Yeah. Do you know what I read that? Did did, did you read that the other day? I read read that and couldn't believe it, but it's true though, eh? Yeah, it's crazy, yeah. isn't it? Although, I mean. Why not? You've had a convertible, haven't you? I have got a convertible, yeah. I have got um, a BMW M3 convertible. I've got one of the old ones. My oh, nice. yeah, 2005 plate M3 convertible, yeah. I love it. Proper car. It's great. It comes out in the summertime, and it's the man- manual, which I yeah. really wanted. So it's not it's not very quick. It's not super fast, but it's actually it's really good fun to drive. It's it's love. You you feel that you're in in a motor that you enjoy having a little drive around the country lanes, particularly where we live here, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire way. It's mm. it, it's a great car to be in, and my little man loves it as well. He loves sitting in the back with a roof down. And how is he? Is he all right? He's all right, yeah. He's he's pleased to be back at school. That's for certain. Yeah. I mean, I say he's pleased. We're pleased. Like I'm, <laughs> like I, yeah, we're we're pleased. I mean, but it's great. It's great that he's back. So listen, Tom. Let's talk about the car history then. Sort of take us back to those halcyon days and mum and dad cars and things. Do you have vivid memories of the cars of your childhood when you perhaps say the same age as your kids? Yeah, to be honest. So my mum and dad had a bit of a bumpy relationship. To be fair, like they split up when I was. Um, 11 but my dad wasn't around much when we were 
when we were little little kids anyway. So I grew up in Gloucester, but uh, my dad was from South East London, heading out towards Beckenham in Kent, that kind yeah. of area. That's where him and his family were from. But I remember the the, the one car that we had that he, he had. We had an actual. We had an old London cab, and we oh, we wow. were. Like so, driving around Gloucester. So I must have been. It must have been 1980. Probably I was around about seven years old, yeah. six or seven years old. And our car, our family car, was a London black cab. <laughs> and he wasn't a taxi driver. Yeah. He was just. That was. I mean, you could pick him up for dirt cheap. The parts would cost next to nothing. Mm. So it was kind of like it was. It was. Um, it got quite a high mileage on it. And it, <laughs> that was that was our family car. It was a black a London black cab <laughs> driving around Gloucester. It was kind of like quite a weird thing to have i think because in those days like nobody like no one they weren't anywhere else either now yeah those kind of black cab style taxis are mm. all over the country people mm. recognize it but at that point it was only ever in london so driving one of those around gloucester yeah it was <laughs> it was it was a very well recognized motor that's for certain <laughs> very different to all, all your mates in cortinas and cavaliers and whatnot exactly that yeah so they all had that sort of stuff and then and then obviously when my mum and dad split up, my mum they had very little money. So she was on hand me down cars normally from her brother, my uncle or whatever we had. So or they weren't proper nails. But I remember my mum had for years she had uh, uh Austin Allegro in kind of Ooh. like um yeah, it was brown with Ooh. um kind of bra- beige interior. And <laughs> I and, and and do you know what? It lasted quite a while. It la it lasted quite well compared to like all the other Allegros that were constantly blowing up or, or just failing or just r- rusting apart. Was it a square steering wheel one? It was, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was a square steering wheel one, and the only the only accident she ever had it when it was actually my fault. I sat in the back seat and I rolled a tennis ball under the seat. And it went underneath the brake pedal when she oh, was reversing. No. So then when she put her foot, it couldn't, she couldn't reverse. <laughs> so she reversed into a car behind it. And it was like, because I put a tennis ball there. So it was kind of like, so that was what, that was the only time um, that she bumped it. And then she ended up getting rid of it. Uh, and then her next one was a Triumph 2000, which was blue with beige interior. Yeah. I'm trying to remember the Triumph 2000. I can't picture it in my head. Ah, hold on. Yes, I can. Yeah, quite quite a big flat front on it. Is that right? That's it. Big yeah, flat yeah. front on it, and a yeah. kind of like a like a gapy old boot. But it was it was lovely. I remember that moment, thinking that was a, like a really cool car. But obviously, it was about fifteen years old then. Mm. Like so, it was a, it wasn't a great motor. What like all my other mates' dads were like, they were all in like brand new Sierras. <laughs> so yeah, those, that, those are the kind of childhood car memories yeah. that I had. And what was your first car you got? My first car, so I left school when I was um, 15, 16 with not very much in the way of um, GCSEs. And I dosed around for about two years before I ended up in a kitchen. And I was doing, I ended up doing a bit of television work, funny enough. Like I went to a youth theatre because it was quite, it got me off the streets basically mm-hmm. with my best mate. And we end, I ended up strangely appearing in an episode of Miss Marple. Like I joined this youth theatre three weeks later, I'm filming a Christmas special in Miss Marple. It was all a bit weird, <laughs> but I earned quite a bit of cash from it from like two weeks work. It was like, yeah. it was a, for a 17 year old, it was a huge, a huge yeah. amount of money. Mm. Um, so I bought, um, it was a MG Montego. Wow. I absolutely loved it. Yeah. Cracker. And I had it for, um, for exactly three weeks and I wrote it off in a head-on collision somewhere <laughs> outside Nottingham. <laughs> and because I couldn't afford the insurance, like proper insurance, it was third-party only insurance. Yeah. So I basically, I three weeks, I, I, like I had a car for three weeks. Any money that I earned in doing that TV show was God. three weeks worth. Of, I had it for three weeks. I may as well just set fire to the thing in the back garden, to be honest. But it was, uh, yeah, it was a complete write-off. They used to have one of those pull-out stereos. So oh, I, yeah, remember, yeah. I remember being in that car crash and seeing the stereo fly through past my head. <laughs> like it was, it was like, but yeah, that was, that, was, that was my first motor and I had it three weeks. They used to have, do you remember? And it wasn't so much that you would take the whole stereo out, but sometimes you could just take the front off it. Do you remember yeah, those? Yeah, you clip off the, 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 the display thing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, pop front stereos. That was that was next level. You used to have a little box that you could put it in. This one, this one was the way you have to pull Take the, the whole, whole thing stereo out, out yeah. and carry this thing that was about <laughs> ten kilos around like a really rubbish and, handbag. And that, that's that's a ridiculous thing, isn't it? And, and like nobody ever sort of no, nobody thought twice about it. But you would do that, and you know you go and meet your mates for for lunch or go and have a pint or something, and you'd have to have this bloody stereo with you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> a load of electronics <laughs> on your arm. Yeah, I've forgotten about that. But that's what that's what we did. 
Or you get lazy and stick it in the boot and then everyone would know that, oh, he's yeah. taking the stereo out, it's in the boot. And then you come back and your boot had been crowbarred open <laughs> and they've, they've, yeah. they've bent the doors, they've got in and they've taken the full stereo out, including the speakers as well. Made a real mess everywhere. Everywhere. And then moving on from that, I bought, um, after I wrote that one off, I bought um, Vauxhall Astra. Uh, okay. 1.3. I had to mm-hmm. go down a little bit. Vauxhall Astra 1.3. In uh, it was orange with orange interior. Now, did you go down because of insurance reasons? Because obviously you pranged the first one. So then you're yeah. thinking, you know what, my my track record at whatever 17 or whatever isn't hot at the minute. So you've got to yeah. go down to come back up again. Mind you, you get a discount on orange on orange. Would, would, <laughs> would, would, it's highly undesirable. It was highly undesirable, which is why it cost almost next to nothing. But do you know what? I love that car. I. I I thought it was a, it was the first one that I actually really enjoyed. Really light, quite good fun. You could get mm. your mates in it. I didn't really care about it too much. So it didn't matter. It was full of pizza boxes and cigarette butts. <laughs> that kind of like it was it was a, it was a really good motor. I had it for ages actually. It was really good. We said this before. It's the freedom that it gives you, and it doesn't really matter what it is, you know. And and we're in a situation now where we're all kind of middle aged men. We like our cars, but back then it's just about having something that will physically get you from A to B. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, and that's magical at that age. Yeah, I used to think that actually the music that you played in the car made you cooler than the car because the car was not cool. <laughs> and then moving on from that, I went, I went through the boy racer period. So I, I went through having a full Piesta XR2 with the pepper pot alloys. Nice. That. that was a white one. That uh, was really nice. Mark II or Mark One? A uh, Mark II, which was great fun. And then I had a, a 1.6 205 GTI. Oh, cracking car. Yeah, I loved it. I loved that one. My favourite one that I moved on to after that got rid of was a Citroen AX GT. Oh, yeah. Okay. Honestly, I really? absolutely loved that motor. Silver, uh, black interior. It was the 1.4 engine, but there was something about it. It was really responsive, really nippy. Yeah. It constantly, the gear ratios, it was constantly asking for more, for more, for more. Right. It was like such a great motor to drive, particularly as like, you yeah, know, 22, 23 years old at this point. It's, it was just. It was an amazing car and absolutely loved it. You know, the 205 GTI is one of those cars that there were so many around when when we were, you know, that age, if you like. And yeah. now you very rarely see one. And I was going to the shops the other day and I saw one at the junction and I just, I was, I was mesmerized by it. I was more fascinated by that than I would have been with any Lambo or Ferrari or Bentley or anything like that. And I saw this thing, I nearly missed the turning cause I was gawping at it so much. And I just saw you never see, and it was immaculate. The 1.6 GTI 205, it was beautiful. Don't they look small? Mm. I saw one the other day in Marlow, right? Was it a white one? It was a white one, right? It's the same one because we live close by. And as I was going over the bridge, right, it was coming the other way. Did you look who the driver was? No. Right. I thought, God, that car's lush. Who's that? And then uh, I, I love one of those. Yeah, I used to have one of those. And I stopped because obviously in Marlow Bridge, you got to let you, yeah, you yeah. Walk, wait for the other car to come over. And it's going, it was Chris Evans. No way, was it? Was it? Was it really? Chris Evans, mate, because there aren't many of them around. No. There There aren't many of them around, so yeah. If I see it again, I'm going to take the reg and I'll check it with you. (laughs) Yeah, it's a lush motor. They are lush, aren't they? They're really... And they go for a lot of money now, don't they? Yeah, they're starting to climb, aren't they? I did a a film shoot a couple of years ago and we had the the new Peugeot hot hatch and the 1.9 old 205 GTI. And it was unbelievable. Mm. It was better than the new one. Yeah. Weighed nothing, all glass, no metal. Great thing. And, and that was their car. And I forget I forget what the insurance was, because you know, or we, or we were told, look, look after this, because it was something like 30-odd grand's worth. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was mint. Yeah, but they're, they're lo- lovely motors. They, I, I love that kind of era, um, of that kind of uh, that hot hatch era, you know, the 205s, the XR3Is and the Renault 5 GT turbos, all of those, yeah. like that era of when those cars were like that, they were super exciting, weren't they? They were really cool, really fast, really nippy, really good fun. So, you know, uh, this this period of time when you've got yourself into the Citroen, yeah. what was going on with you and your career at that point? Where, mm. where, whereabouts were you? So I was, ju- I just moved into London. So I was, I was in the West Country and I moved there when I was in my early 20s. So it's about that time I, I drove down there. I remember in the, in, with the Citroen. So I'd have been about 21, 22 years old. Uh, 
And I moved from the West Country, um, working in country house hotels, all the way into London. At that point in the early 90s, to be in the heart of London in this busy, buzzy industry was just a brilliant, brilliant space to be. It was just mm. great. Marco Pierre White was winning three Michelin stars. Nico Dennis was winning three Michelin stars. You know, the, the, the British culinary scene was really beginning to spark into life, you know. It wasn't just the French guys at the Gavroche. It was now chefs that had worked for them were beginning to do really, really, really well. And is that when, you know, the big the big light bulb came on in your mind where you thought, you know what, I, I can have a go at this? Yeah, I never really thought I'd have my own place. I, I thought at some point, I the, the thing about being a chef is it's, it's a very clear and defined career path. You know, you start mm-hmm. as a commie chef. It's quite regimental. You start as a commie chef and you become a chef de party and then a sous chef and then a head chef and there's lots of bits in the middle and it depends where you work and where you go but you you got opportunities to travel the world and you can see so many different things but there is kind of like regimented layers and levels that you build up to there's a ladder and a structure and a system okay. so it was quite easy as a as a youngster when i started off cooking to see that there's a career path and a route as you get better mm-hmm. at stuff you keep growing and I thought one day I'd be a head chef. One day, would I win a mission star? Maybe, who knows? I never thought I'd own my own place. It was wow. That was never something that I thought I'd end up undertaking. Even towards my mid to late 20s, I suppose, it was kind of like, it was then that I started thinking maybe, well, maybe it'd be quite interesting. But the reality was I was on a, I was, I, I was so lucky that I found an industry um that I love very much, a vocation, a way of life, you know, that people that I want to be around. And none of it was ever based around money or cash. It was all mm. about, is this great fun? Am I, you could work really hard. You could do, you know, 80, 90, 100 hour weeks. But if you're enjoying it, it's not a job. Oh, it's a way yeah. of life. And I, and I thoroughly loved it. So there's a huge amount of ambition, but I didn't know where to focus it and drive it. That's probably the best way of describing it. And how old were you when you first got your own place? Was your first place to Hand and Flowers or did you have your own place before that? No, Hand and Flowers was the first place. I was a head chef in a restaurant before that where I kept a mission star for two years. Mm-hmm. And then I opened the Hand and Flowers when I was 31. So still young, isn't it? Oh yeah, he's still pretty young to take on a business. Like like any, you know, husband and wife team, we took on a business. I mean we we blagged it. We lied to the banks. We borrowed on credit cards. We did, you know, it's all it's all a massive flag. And I mean, yeah. life is a massive flag, all of, of it. it but it was just like we just kind of went, well, let's go for it. Let's have a go. Let's open. Let's open this pub. And you know, we we told the bank that we were doing a little extension in a house that we had in Norfolk, where I was. We were living at that point, and we bought the hand of flowers instead, <laughs> and, and we borrowed loads of money on a credit card. And then when the bank found out, we were like, well, you know. We've spent the uh, extension money on tables and chairs in this pub. I mean, <laughs> if you want it back, you'll have to shut us, or you can back us, and we'll go with it. And to be fair to the bank, at that point, they were, they were very, they, they were like, okay, well, we, we, you know, let's go with it. Let's, go, we'll, mm. we'll go with it for a year Brilliant. and see what happens. And we, you know, within that first year, we won a mission star. So it was kind of like, it, it's, it's good. We backed ourselves. We, mm-hmm. we blagged it. We had confidence to have a go at it. But you know, it was, uh, hold it, on a bit, Tom. Did you just say in your first year you won a Michelin star? Yeah, we did. Van der Flowers opened in um, March the, the 5th, 2005. And January, when the Michelin Guide came out in 2006, we were awarded a star. So, yeah, 10 months. Mate, that's insane, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's amazing. That's some achievement, isn't it? I mean, genuinely. i tell you what I never realised until the other day. And this this probably now sounds like a ridiculous thing to say. I never knew that Michelin star was also the same people that make the tyres. I just assumed <laughs> that they were two completely I, different I companies. Mean. I never knew that. What have you been up to this morning? I never knew that. Honestly? No, I didn't know. I, I thought that I thought it must have been the same name, but one was about fine dining and the other was about about tyres. And I never knew they were the same thing. <laughs> well, the guide was ri- originally written. I mean, if, even if you buy the guide now, it's all about maps. And it, oh. But it was originally um, written to encourage people to go driving to wear out their tyres right. so that they have to buy more tyres. <laughs> you know, it was a... And whilst you're on your drive around, here's some nice restaurants that you should be driving to. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a three-star place place that says it's definitely worth a detour or spur- it's worth a special journey is telling you to go and drive 400 miles in your, <laughs> in your car wear out your tires buy some more <laughs> it's like an elaborate scam isn't it 
yeah. <laughs> between the tyre company and the restaurateurs. Yeah, it's a massive scam to sell tyres. <laughs> hey, talk, go, going back to food, I saw a tweet you put out the other day and it stopped me in my tracks. That burger... Did not, not right to put that tweet out. I think it was 11 in the morning. That just ruined the rest of my day because I wanted it and I couldn't have it. They look insane. Is that is that a new venture? They're amazing. So they're the, they're the burgers that are in the butcher's tap, but we, we've we've re, we've redone it and rebuilt it. So it was operating as a butcher's and a pub. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually remember a really good night that we had in there, Jason, when I was um, still yeah. drinking. Yeah. When I say I remember that night, I know we were in there. One of your <laughs> last days on the yeah. booze. It might even been your last day on the booze. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, Christmas about eight years ago. So it was like, yeah, it'd be eight years I haven't drunk since. And I think you're probably partly responsible for me never drinking again. <laughs> I mean, <basically. laughs> Join the queue. <laughs> yeah, if, yeah, for any of you that know Jason or any of you that don't just know his reputation, it is all true. I mean, yeah, it's a, he's enough. He's a, he, spending time with Jason is enough to make you not drink ever again. <laughs> Here's a question for you, Tom. As somebody who's obviously, you know, in the world of fine food and, and you've rightly got the accolades that you deserve, but what would you say is your ultimate comfort food? Is it shepherd's pie? Is it bangers and mash? What's your go-to? Yeah, I love really slow-cooked meats and dishes like that, things like casseroles, things, mm-hmm. things that make your house smell lovely. You know, like <laughs> yeah. if you put in a shoulder of lamb in the oven and you ra- roast it for four or five hours and, you know, you go out for a walk with the dogs or whatever and you come back in and you open the house and there's that lovely homely smell mm. of beautiful cooking, you know, stuff like that I absolutely love. Quick quick and easy stuff you stuff in front at the table and everyone helps himself like the big omelette kind of thing in a big pan like a spanish yep. tortilla omelette sort of thing i love and then like eating out some of the best food experiences i've had i've not been in three mission star restaurants they they are some of the best food experiences but mm. actually some of the most magical things i i was very fortunate that i did a bit of a road trip around america for a tv sh- series for on um, food network yeah and i went to um uh, i went to a taco um kind of shack on a on a on a street somewhere in Tucson in Arizona, and it mm-hmm. was just brilliant. It was magical, phenomenal yeah. food, like chopped up bits of meat that had been cooked on smoky coals, and was with some spicy salsa served in like a little taco shell or wrap. And it was just like, do you know what? This is just brilliant, brilliant food because it's so much more about the energy, the space, the place, the environment, the people you're with, and yeah. all of those. Are, that, that's why food is so magical because it does create some brilliant, brilliant kind of memories and spaces. So, mm. so for me, it's always about the simple food is always the best stuff. You know, I love it when chefs are showcasing experience and skill and produce and, you know, who doesn't love like black truffle and gold leaf and all of that sort of stuff for like real over the top opulence yeah. and ridiculous event <laughs> evenings. Amazing. Mm. But day to day, food has to be simple, homely, make you smile, make you feel happy. You know, there's and and you get that from you can get that from fish and chips on a beach in Brighton mm. in mm. the winter when it's blowing a gale and it's cold, but you sat there wrapped up in your big coat with fish and chips that are stuck to the paper with loads <laughs> of old vinegar on it. It's cool. I love that stuff. Absolutely. You know, obviously, as somebody who, who likes their cars, what's your view on electric? Have you owned one? Can you see yourself owning one? Do you know what? I'm a huge admirer of the technology. I think everything about it is brilliant. But, but for me, the infrastructure is not there yet. I don't like having to wait and serve, I like it having to plan a journey, you know, having to be so structured that you got, and then when it comes to recharging, you got to sit for 45 minutes. And yeah. I, I, it, my life is really busy and I spin lots of plates and I'm all over the place. You get in the car, you drive, you need petrol, you stop, you fill it up, you grab yourself a packet of crisp or a Mars yeah. bar or whatever else, and off you go again. Do you know what I mean? You just oh. go. Yeah. Like the 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 infrastructure isn't there yet for my life. Totally agree. However, I do think that they are, they haven't got the mileage yet or they haven't got the, the range, isn't it? The, it is the range. Yeah. But I do, you know, we all know that's where we're going to be. We all know mm. that, you know, in 15 years time, 20 years time, that's where every brand new car is electric, isn't it? You know, everything is, is going to, we all know that's where it's going to be at. But for me, it's just not quite there yet. And also, they're all a bit uninteresting. I've mm. got to be honest, like all of the cars, <laughs> they all, there's no, there's no character yet, is there? They haven't, none of them have quite developed. I mean, you guys know, Jason, I know better. You've probably driven all of them, Jason. Mm. Like, the, uh, there's probably only the Porsche 
isn't uh, there? Oh, the Taycan. That, that's it. Or, or the yeah. e-tron, the Audi e-tron. Listen, I, like you, Jason, you've driven loads of cars. I'm very fortunate, right? I've got three motors, all right? And, and I love all three of them, and they all got a different purpose and a reason. You know, the M3, I absolutely love. It's an old, it's a bit of an old workhorse, but it's great fun to drive comes out in the summer. I've got, um, I, I've got a lovely 911 that I bought a few years ago from brand new, and it's great. And it's, it's sat there. It's the, the, uh, the 911 GTS. It's the rear-wheel drive. It's not that practical in terms of getting people in it, but it's... I love it. It's absolutely mm. great fun. And I got an Audi RS6. There's the one there with the boot. So, and it's, a, and it is actually the daftest thing I've ever bought. It's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like this crazy, like <laughs> lunatic beast. It's been, it's been chipped and it's been also, it's got 740 brake horsepower. Is it it's, really? It's, oh yes. Yeah, it is the most ridiculous thing in the world. And I've no wow. idea how to drive it. It's just like, <laughs> I, I need to employ you as a chauffeur to get the most out of that motor, mate, because it's just like, it's, it's the loudest thing. It's the most unsubtle, ridiculous, stupid like thing ever. But I absolutely love it. I'm in love with it. It's the most mm. crazy mental motor, but they're all, all three of them are they're different characteristics. And, mm. I enjoy that about cars. They all make you feel different. They all do different jobs. They all, and at the minute, those electric cars, there isn't, there isn't personality to them. And that's something that cars, that's what people fall in love with. That's what people who like driving, we like cars that give you a sense, don't they? They they make you feel alive for a reason. It smells as well, isn't it? Yeah. Cars, cars should smell. You know, if you think back at the ones that really, you know, especially when you're a kid and even now, is that cars should have a smell. They should smell of oil and petrol, shouldn't they? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that's the reason why you love motorsport as well. When mm. when you go to see cars racing and you go, there is that the sense of the smell, the noise, the energy, the, everything that it creates. I haven't actually been to see any of the Formula E races yet. And they look actually quite exciting and fast mm. and super zipping. It's a different kind of experience. It doesn't rock my boat. No. People are called petrol heads for a reason, aren't they? Yeah, mm. well, see, interesting enough, my, my girls, um, they're not interested in engines or noise at all. In fact, them and their mates quite like the idea of this sci-fi electric kind of car. And I wonder if it's tapping into a new, a new different sort of person. And, you know, I might imagine in 20 years' time, the landscape of the automotive world is going to be so different. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of glad I'm on the way out, actually, because I, I don't think it's going to be that exciting, bearing in mind where we've come from. It's also on the whole question of ownership as well, I mean, which I find even more depressing, I guess. You know, I mean, um, I think we all share the same opinion on electric cars. We, we appreciate them and we know and agree that they're the future, but it's difficult to get excited about them. But it's the other thing, when you consider our kids when they grow up, will they even own a car or will they just press an app and actually an electric Uber or something will turn up and take them into town or take them to the cinema or whatever? You know, it's yeah. they might not have the same relationship with a vehicle that we've always had. That's horrible, Dave. That's absolutely blown my mind. I've not thought of that before. <laughs> I've not thought that through. And that's, that's in a horrific space Isn't that we're going to be heading to. Um, it's that- horrible. But unfortunately, I think that it is more than a possibility because I think the kids might not have that relationship with cars, especially if they're characterless as well. There'll be no desire to maybe spend that money up front when they can get an app and they kind of go, no, I need need transport to go into town. I'll just... I don't know. We'll see. I hope it doesn't happen, but I'm fearful it might. Yeah, but it is one of those things that people who enjoy doing it, they enjoy doing it because it's not just, you know, there's people that love driving that don't yeah. race there's people that enjoy yeah, driving yeah. that don't try and drive quickly or go yeah. around corners the fastest or do whatever they just enjoy the process of driving they enjoy mm. being in a car and being in control of their own destiny of themselves surely that will still exist that independence mm. i hope so so here's a couple of quick fire questions for you tom yes all the cars you've owned if you had to pick one and stick with it forever what would it be uh then 911 my 911 <laughs> yeah, gts i knew you were gonna say that <laughs> Yeah, the same with me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> forget about getting the kids. In. Forget about the practicality or whatever. That's what I'm keeping. Back. You can get the yeah, kids you in the can. back. I mean, yeah, you can. I mean, you get adults in the back, but they're a bit stiff afterwards. But at least you can get them in there. <laughs> yeah, I, you can't get an adult behind me. Not not in that <laughs> no, 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 I, There would be no other, there would be no adult sat behind me. But you can. My little man can get in the back of it. Yeah. Now he can. Yeah. You wait yeah. till he's a six footer. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, he won't be getting in. <laughs> right. I've got a question for you as well before we uh, before we let you go, because I know you're a busy man, right? So here's the thing. Music and cars, we always think, go well together. So we need your fantasy drive, Tom Carriage. Where are you? Where are you going? What are you listening to? And most importantly, what are you driving? Okay, so there's, there's I mean, there's quite a few questions there. There's a number of them. I mean, where am I going? Maybe down to Cornwall. I mean, you could you could you could give loads of wonderful yeah. like places to drive and wherever else. But uh, I'm from the West Country originally, so down to Cornwall to Padstow to see me mate Paul, who's uh, <laughs> Paul Lanesworth, who's got a beautiful restaurant down there, and we've known each other for like 25 years. We've been great friends forever. So driving down to Cornwall to see Paul, um, music wise. Um, probably probably going to be I, now i love kind of like lots of indie bands and i love things like Kasabian and oasis and yeah. whatever else but actually driving tunes i quite like 90s dance tunes kind of like uh, lots of like happy house or uh, okay. trance 90s yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff i would go with that and what am i driving so I keep looking every year. This year, definitely not this year. This has been a bad year. This has been this has been a year of massive, major, catastrophic losses. Yeah. However, if we can ever get it back, there's so many motors that I'd love to own, and you could go with supercars, and you can go with everything. But I just remember when I, when they first came out, I absolutely loved them, and I still would love one now. And that's a Ferrari 355 GTS, but it's got to be manual. So it, with reds with the cream interior. So yeah. there's uh, there's loads of Ferraris you could pick from. There's loads of Lamborghinis. There's loads of you know you you any. But for me, a Ferrari three five five GTS. I don't know, uh, Jason. Is, uh, would they be worth a punt with a bit of cash on it? Oh, absolutely. Well, I used to, I that was my I promised myself by the time I get to thirty, and I promised this years ago, I'd I'd have a Ferrari, and I just 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 actually I was a few days over, but I yeah. got a three five five GTB from Germany. And I'll tell you what, I still wish I had it now. It's fantastic. And they've not gone mental yet, but they are going to go. Because I think I think all the cars after that, until the 458 came along, but weren't, weren't good-looking cars. That was the last beautiful... Because you remember the one that came after, it was the 360, which was awful. Yeah. The 355's a stunning car. Stunning. Yeah, I, do, I was going to say a four five eight as well. I quite like the four five eight. They, they, you're right. They, it would get three five five or a four five eight. Yeah. But I think the three five five just because it's when when did they come out? Ninety five? Are they ninety five? Yeah, 96? About that, yeah. Yeah. So it's that point where I'm like twenty two, twenty three years old, and you're going. You, you know, I'm dream. You're dream. You've got dream motors. Do you know what I mean? You're driving yeah. around. I'm driving around in a Citroen AX GT and I'm going, oh, I wish it was a Ferrari 355. <laughs> Listening to Oasis and everything. Yeah, exactly. Exactly yeah. that. So, go, yeah. actually, you know, as a, as a, as a child of, of born in the early 70s, growing up in the mid 80s, you know, but it's the 90s that is the, is the time where I properly like lived a life as a tw- yeah. in your 20s, having a yeah. great time, yeah. you know, kind of carefree, no mortgage, no, no wife at that point, no kids, no, mm. just like being a massive idiot. At that point, I would love, I would love to go back to being a massive idiot, but this time with a Ferrari. Mate, I'm just thinking about catapulting my head back there now, but it's it sounds too good. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. So that would be that's that's the car. Well, that's it for this week's fueling around, powered by Edwin Flux, as the UK's largest specialist insurance broker. Edwin Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help you save money on your car, your bike or your home insurance. Thank you, Dave, as always, and a huge thank to our special guest this week, the megastar, that's Tom Kerridge. Thanks, mate. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It's an absolute pleasure talking about motors. Thank you very much indeed. Don't forget, you can get in touch with us on Twitter at Jason Plato or at David Vitti. And if you'd like what you've heard, feel free to give us a five-star rating, press the subscribe button and share the podcast on all your socials. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. So then, uh, Tom, when when are we coming round your place then for for beer garden stuff? Yeah, April, April, mate. The burgers, A- burgers and chips will be on me. Sweet, right. Mm-hmm.